If I were to describe how the average Catholic looks at the world today, I'd describe it like this. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven, and everybody's going that way. And narrow is the door that leads to hell, and hardly anybody's going that way. But you know what? That's just the opposite of what Jesus himself tells us the situation is. Broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are traveling that way. And narrow is the door that leads to life, and few there are who are finding it. Now, Jesus didn't say this because this is how it has to be. People who are on the Broadway don't have to stay on the Broadway, and that's where we come in. That's where our prayer, that's where our love, that's where our intercession, that's where our witness comes in. We need to really invite people to leave the path that's leading to destruction and find the person of Jesus Christ who can lead them to true life here on this earth and eternal life. Welcome to The Choices We Face. I'm Peter Herbeck, and I'm here today with Tom Corcoran. Tom is the author of a dynamite new book, in my opinion. It's called, co-author of this book called the, uh, Rebuilt, The Story of a Catholic Parish, Awakening the Faithful, Reaching the Lost, and Making the Church Matter. Welcome, Tom. Hey, Peter, it's great to be with you. Yeah, glad, glad you could be here. here. Glad you'd be here. Well, I, I'm just delighted that you're here because I, I love the book, and I love what God is doing with you guys. And I wonder if we could just begin, share a little bit first with our listeners about you, a little bit about yourself and your family, and then I'd love to just dive in and hear the story behind the book. Well, I, I grew up in Philadelphia, so I'm from Philadelphia. Um, I have three younger sisters, went to Catholic school my whole life, um, then went to Loyola University. You know, it was Loyola College at the time, but Loyola University in Baltimore. And it was there that I kind of realized that my Catholic faith was really important, kind of leaving home and, and going away and going to Mass each week was really important to me. And I uh, also kind of realized pro-life was important to me. My dad had always done March for Life and that kind of thing. And being that close to D.C., I'm like, I got to go to D.C. for the March for Life. And so just for me, college is where I think my faith, I began to own it. And um, then I went, after I graduated, I was going to work in D.C. And I uh, wanted to get maybe pro-life politics. And during that time, met my now wife, Mia. And worked for a year in D.C. and decided it really wasn't for me. And at the same time, a professor from Loyola, Sue Abermitis, called me and said, would you be interested in a career change? And I was definitely interested in pursuing new options and checking out new things. And I thought, I was about to get married, thought about going to school. I thought, maybe I should go somewhere where there's a paycheck. <laughs> so yeah. um, I was like, I'll take the job at the church. And I wound up taking the job at the church to do youth ministry, which is nativity. And uh, I was thought I'd be there maybe three years. And I've been there 16 years now, so. Fantastic. Now, were you, we you actually trained at all in youth ministry? Like, you just, you just jumped in. They said, here's a good guy, solid guy, solid Catholic. Let's hire him and him. Yeah, that was more it. Um, my pastor, Michael White, who wrote the book with, had talked to, to Sue Abermanis, the professor, and just said, do you know of anybody that's graduated recently that's kind of just a solid Catholic person? I'm not sure I qualify that, <laughs> yeah. but, um, you know, I, I was going to Mass each week, and she knew I kind of had a yeah. solid love of the yeah. church, and so she pointed him to me, and that's, yeah, that was the only training I had. I think it's a huge foundation. I think my 16 years of Catholic school between grade school, high school, college were, were huge, mm -hmm. I think, and set a great foundation for me, but that was the only training I had. Now, you're married, and tell us a little bit about your family. I'm married to my wife, Mia. We've been married 15 years, and we have six kids, so. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what do you my, have? How many boys, how many girls? Five boys, one girl. So it's Max, Gus, Nate, then I have my daughter, Elsa, and then uh, Kefa, who is three, and then my son, Caleb, who's 10 months. Oh, very good. God's blessing you. Now, tell us a little bit, tell us the story about how did, how did this book, which is really touching, uh, it's captivated the attention of Catholics all around the country, as you know, because you're being, you know, you're in demand now, you know, and uh, bishops, priests, lay people all around the country are talking in part about this book. What's happening? Well, it's, it's as you said in the beginning, it's the story of our parish that in time that we just stopped at a certain point and said we want to share our story. And um, it began really in frustration that, uh, as I said, I came into a parish not really knowing how it should work. Uh, my pastor, Father White, had worked um, for, as the secretary to Cardinal Keeler, but he really hadn't worked in a parish. And so both of us, we worked really hard. And as we share in the story, uh, we realized we were working really hard and we were kind of working on the wrong wall or lean, lean the ladder up against the wrong wall that 
we were creating religious consumers. And um, for about five years, we ran really hard till we kind of stopped and said, why are we doing this? And what impact are we do having? And we felt like we were doing a lot of hard work, but nothing was different after than before. And what, do you mean, what do you mean by you were creating religious consumers? Um, we share the story in Rebuilt, but um, the kind of quintessential thing is we did these things called Family Friendly Fridays uh, in Lent. And so uh, we would do these six Fridays in which we'd have a speaker and we'd have dinner and we'd it, it got all this stuff going on, but dinner was kind of the main, was huge, and then the speaker was huge, but the, the dinner was free. And at one point, um, parishioners were coming up and complaining about the food. <laughs> and that's the free food. <laughs> yeah. And so, again, it, sort of there's an ingratitude, obviously, but they're sort of like, okay, this isn't the type of people we're supposed to be forming. You know, uh, we should be forming people who are, are, are much different than this. Yeah. And so out of that frustration, and for me, I was doing youth ministry, and um, I was doing all these events and activities, ski trips, lock-ins, all these things, and I'm like, Again, I'm not sure I'm making the impact on kids I'm supposed to be making. And I heard a book from a, a fellow youth minister called Purpose Driven Youth Ministry, uh, written by Doug Fields. And I'm a person that sometimes books just change me. I, I don't know what that is. There's hmm. certain books I can look to. Yeah. And that was one. I read it. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Um, you mean there should be a strategy? to how we're forming people. I mean, we can have a plan. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it feels so unspiritual to think that way, right? Yeah, or well, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, way. yeah, it does, I guess it can, but I was like, it just lights went off. I need a plan for the youth ministry program here and a strategy and, and also what Doug Fields had done and, and what I had hoped in this book was he shared his frustrations, he shared his failures and that just made me feel better. I, I thought I was crazy. I thought, you know, in trying to do work and not seeing an impact that something was wrong with me, and again, we all have our faults and failures, but I realized, no, um, I'm not the only one who struggles working in ministry. Yeah, and so then, uh, you, when did you and Father Mike come together on this and say, something's got to change? Did it come out of your work, at, uh, that, that the change in your own work from reading that book? And uh, how did it all happen that the whole ball started rolling parish-wide? Well, I have to give credit to Father White in the sense that he always was open to new ideas. Um, and he kind of gave that permission. But I, as I started sharing some of the things that um, I was learning from Purpose Driven Youth Ministry and implementing in the youth ministry at parish council meetings, he would kind of come back and be like, that was really good stuff. And then uh, one time Saddleback Church, which is Rick Warren's church and Doug Fields, Doug Fields is no longer there, but he was there, was having a conference and I just emailed him and said, hey, you want to go check this out? And he wrote back, yeah, let's go. And we went and we just had a great experience there. We were again, overawed at the community that was there, that these were a community of people we really, we were drawn into, whereas when we compared it to the community we had formed and our leadership had formed, it wasn't the same community. It doesn't compare on a certain level. Now, didn't Father Michael have an initial reaction against it when he was there? Was there some kind of, something in the book, does he say something that it would, was just hard for him to hear well, initially? Well, uh, both of us were very nervous, being, we were afraid of being outed as Catholics in oh, the yeah, evangelical yeah. setting. And I think sometimes, the Protestant Catholic thing, and obviously there are theological differences, but I think so many times it's just cultural. Mm -hmm. But what you're referring to is, uh, so we went to this youth conference, and then he had such a great experience, about a month later he went out to Rick Warren's pastor's conference. Okay. And Rick Warren is, at a certain point towards the end of the conference, just started laying in the pastors, really challenging them, saying, we gotta step up our game. I mean, people are, 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 are dying out there. We gotta step up our game and just laying in the pastors, and, Father White mentioned he just got mad. He's like, who is, who is this guy to talk to me? Oh, okay. And yeah. I, you know, I, I studied in Rome, and I was secretary to Cardinal Keogh. And I'm working hard. And I'm who, working yeah, hard. Yeah. And I ran the Pope's visit in Baltimore. Yeah. And he's walked to the car, and it's a long walk to the car at Saddleback <laughs> Church. Yeah. And he said, he's right. He's totally right. And he, 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 that was a conversion experience for him. Yeah. And he, he walked back, and um, we began changing things at our church from that. And so, how did you, how did what did you do? What were the changes that began to implement? How were you, did you feel led by the Lord to kind of what steps did you take? Well, we tried to just again. We saw things were working at, at Saddleback Church. We studied other churches and we saw what was working. And we just in the beginning just trying to copy them in some ways and bring them into our context. Obviously, Catholic context is different and liturgical context, but there were things we could easily kind of translate in. Um, 
What kind of things? Well, I think one was just a reaffirmation of our love of Scripture and the, for Father White, the importance of preaching, that we saw that as we went to these churches that the preaching was excellent and really good and hitting us as we heard some of the, the, the breakout sessions or some of the talks. And so it was a recommitment to the preaching in our church, uh, a, a commitment to being a welcoming church. Mm -hmm. um, again, Father White shares a story of going into Saddleback Church and being so welcome, warmly welcomed that he went in a different door to see if it would happen again. <laughs> It absolutely did. So yeah. we're like, again, hospitality is a powerful thing, isn't it? I mean, genuine caring for people is really important. Absolutely. And again, it's something any church can do. I mean, it's not that simple. It's not to say we want to do hospitality and it happens. Right. But focused effort over time can create a very hospital, hospitable and welcoming place. And for our church, when people join our church, it's one of the biggest things they mention. It's just a welcoming place. Yeah. So you, scripture, uh, took, you guys went to another level together mm -hmm. with the Word of God. Um, hospitality, is that describe What else, what other kind of things did you start to implement or you thought were important pieces to rebuilding or strengthening the parish? Small groups were a huge thing that we, we saw that small faith sharing communities were really big at these churches and that that was the way they connected people together. And again, a thing that's often lacking, it was lacking in our parish and um, that people didn't know each other, didn't have friends in faith, and so small groups was a big one. The whole just weekend experience that there is a great opportunity there to reach lost people, reach people far from God. And I think that was another huge way we were evangelized, I would say, that we needed to make evangelization and specifically reaching people who were lost or far from God a priority that just sunk in deep too. Yeah, and that's one of the great things I appreciate about the book because it feels like you guys, you know, hit a laser shot about why do we exist? Yeah. And we exist to love God, we exist to love one another, and we exist to make disciples and go seek the law, basically seek the lost and bring them in. Right. And so that's a kind of revolution. All those things, the scripture, the hospitality, uh, the, the, uh, this whole area of being able to reach the lost. What did you concretely do? Let's just talk about scripture for a minute. I mean, I'm sure Father was working hard and, 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 and studied and you were working hard. What did you guys do differently that changed the whole approach to preaching and, and teaching the Word of God as a parish? Well, I think we, number one, prioritized the weekend experience or prioritized the weekend masses. Because again, that's the number one opportunity to reach people. Um, you know, I mentioned we did these family friendly Fridays and we poured hours and hours and hours into that, but we had about maybe 600 people that yeah. there we had about 1,800 people come to Mass. So where could you make the bigger impact? It was on the, the weekend experience and the weekend Masses. So uh, I think that was our number one thing is like we realized we needed to pour time and energy there, put aside other programs and events, and make sure that energy was, was reserved for the weekend what are, experience. What are the things that I would see if I came to your parish on a weekend, which I'd love to do sometime, by the way. We'd love to have you. Yeah. yeah. If, if, uh, what would I see that you guys have made a big investment in that you could point to if we had a conversation and said these are the three or four or five things that we concentrated on to make this weekend special, liturgy special, Eucharist special, and the experience? I think the first thing you would experience coming to our church again is the welcoming, as I said, and from the parking lot. We have parking ministers that are there to help greet you, smile. Again, create a sense of expectation. Do they park your car for you? They don't park your car, no. <laughs> no. It's not valet, so I, okay, people yeah. often mistake that. So that's a common... Thought. No, but th just the parking team out there and, and smiling, welcoming, greeting you, glad you're here kind of thing, pointing you to a place to park. They will help you find a place to park. They will not park your car. But, um, so, but you know, when you go to an event, when there's a parking people out there, it makes you feel excited, right? You know, to go to a ball game or, or yeah. any kind of event, it, it makes you feel excited. Oh, something's happening here. Yeah. Uh, and then the kind of layers of welcome are important. So greeters at the door. And, and again, I think a lot of parishes have these things, but layers of greeting, the greeters at the door, then we have our host team to help, help you find a seat. I think another low-hanging fruit in many places is children's ministry, hmm. and especially children, um, and maybe I'm biased because I have little kids, but under, kindergarten and under, or nursery school age, um, that's when people are coming back to church. You know, there's a certain understanding, any parent knows this, you realize, I need a higher authority than just me. Yeah. This is really hard. Yeah. And then there's just a sort of desire, I think, for people to want to give their kids faith and religion as, as much as a secular society as we've become, that's still out there. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we did do is focus on children's programs um, for little, especially little kids, 
uh, like a nursery program, and uh, we, ours is called Kid Zone. It's three and under, and then all stars four to six. And that, and it's not just about babysitting; it's about providing a foundation of faith for them. So parents can go and listen to the mat, you know, go to mass, listen to the homily, and worship together. And if they have little kids, their kids are being watched and taken care of, and taught the faith. And then they can have this time to be refreshed and rejuvenated. I, I think that just puts a big piece. Look. It's a big piece yeah. and, and a great opportunity especially in our community, which is a community that has a lot of families. Now, uh, when you say you make it, made an investment, you weren't just saying, okay, does anybody want to volunteer to, to uh, take care of the kids this weekend and you know, give them no. a Bible? <laughs> I mean, you guys do some serious training and investment content. How to re Tell us a little bit about what you do to make it happen. Well, at, at first of all, yeah, and that's the other thing is just challenging people already coming to church that, look, you need to serve the mission of the church. Um, you, know, you need to take responsibility, one, for your own faith, and your own spiritual walk, and to responsibility for the mission of the church to reach out to people. So um, we have a whole kind of onboarding process for that. Obviously, there's, we have a thing called First Serve. So we say, hey, check it out first and, and see if you like doing this. Um, then we have an orientation program where people who have volunteered can come and say, again, just reinforcing the mission of our church and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and then the, the, from there, training them into what we're asking them, how they're asking them to serve. No, I, I like the, uh, in the book, and if, friends, I really do encourage you to get the book. It's, it's really good. It's very practical. It's very helpful. And the, uh, one of the things that you guys do so well is that you uh, help people address things in their life that are so important, like service is fundamental. You know, my life's not my own. You help them make discipleship. A, a practical reality in their lives. And a lot of people don't know how to express discipleship, being a disciple of Jesus. It's not that they don't want to. They don't know what to do exactly. Right. And you guys help them. What do you do with your time? How do you use your time? How do you use your treasure? How do you use your money? You guys talk about money in the book. Why don't you say a little bit about that? That's like most people say, don't talk to me about money. It's funny, people say the church constantly talks about money. Most parishes hardly ever say a word about money. Yeah, I think the problem is we don't talk enough about what God says about money. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe we sometimes nag. Uh, Father White talks about a par parish he grew up in that felt like he was being nagged all the time for money. But we don't teach what God says. And, and when you talk about, again, how benefit benefited from these other churches, from mega churches, mm -hmm. that was a huge benefit to me personally. Uh, growing up, and I might have missed it, but I never felt like I understood what the church said about money or that it was a priority. But Jesus talked about money a lot. Mm -hmm. And so as we went to the churches and we heard messages and hom or homilies, messages about money, we realized we need to address this to our own community. And even before that, I need to change my own personal finances. I mm -hmm. uh, heard about tithing and I heard kind of message after message on tithing. I'm like, I've been cheating God for a long time. Mm -hmm. And at a time when I had a lot of debt and uh, just said, I got to start doing this. And so for both of us, both me and Father White, we're like, we got to change our own personal finances. And that then gave us authority, I think, then to challenge the parish yeah. to take money seriously. So God, God's word was coming to you guys in a new way, personally in your lives. And yes. it, was, it was changing, it was convicting you, it was inspiring you. Uh, that's wonderful. That's what the Word of God does. It's living and active. It's powerful. Yeah. And, and uh, I think it's one of the, you know, if there's priests who are listening to the program today, I just want to encourage you to have great confidence in God's Word and, and just l fall in love with that Word and teach it with conviction and teach it with confidence because it will change people's lives. Absolutely. That's, and we, we mentioned in, in Rebuilt that especially two major areas where just preaching God's Word was so huge um, was with finances. So we kind of mentioned there that the, our we didn't have money to fuel this strategy. The support of the church came because of the strategy. And as we talked about money and what God's word said about that, we've seen giving increase uh, incredibly. Still a long way to go, but sure, <laughs> sure. it's definitely, yeah. people are on board. It's hard now. to let go of your money. It, it's, a lot of we find, for all of us, I mean, not for everybody, I suppose, but for many people, it's hard to let go because it's like uh, Cardinal, uh, uh, British Cardinal, I forgot his name, but he used to say, uh, you know, because we put faith in money, we believe with, with money, all things are possible. <laughs> in my, yeah. You know what I mean? And he said, letting that go is letting go of our false security and being able to just place ourselves in the hands of the Lord. So I've had that battle in my own life, no doubt about it. Yeah, I think all of us do. And yeah. so, so we, we've, in preaching about money and then preaching about volunteerism or, or ministry and service have been just so impactful to our parish. And so. so you're building up, that's part of the, how you built up the community. But I want to know, you got to tell our listeners, who's Timonium Tim? 
Timonium Tim, and then we borrowed. You're from Timonium, uh, Maryland. I forgot to mention. Exactly. Yeah, so okay. Timonium is the area um, of where our church is located. We're just outside of Baltimore, north of Baltimore. Um, so Timonium Tim, and we. This is something else we borrowed from Saddleback Church. They had called it Saddleback Sam. We called him Timonium Tim. But Tim is the person in our community, which is a very Catholic community, who went to Catholic school, was confirmed, maybe went to Catholic high school. But once he was confirmed, he stopped going to church because his mom stopped making him. And yeah. he, what he knows about Catholicism is a muddled mess from what he thinks he remembers from school or confirmation classes and what he knows from the Da Vinci Code. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so, and, yeah. but he's not coming to, at the end of the day, Tim is not coming to church. He's prioritizing everything else. Yeah, he drives by the church all the time. He's a busy guy, right? Right. But he doesn't actually stop. He doesn't stop to come to church. He doesn't even, wouldn't even think to come to church, yeah. except for maybe a funeral or a wedding. And Tim is our target. That's kind of how we pin down evangelization. When we talk about evangelization, one, we really mean the person not coming to church. And I know yeah. evangelization in many places can also mean evangelizing the faithful already in the pews. But for us, we mean who's the person not coming to church. Tim's our target. And every week we are trying to speak to him in some way. Um, so we do a, a little, you know, many churches do announcements at the end of Mass. We call them end notes. At the end of Mass every week, or sometime in Father White's homily, we try to say, look, if you are not a church person, if you're not a religious person, if you're only here because someone begged you or bribed you to come, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Yeah. And that's important to say because Tim doesn't know he's welcome. Now, we think, of course you're welcome. God's for He everybody. feels a little uncomfortable, maybe a little slightly guilty or whatever, doesn't know what to think about the whole experience, but he feels like he's on the outside. Yeah. And so it matters to reach out to him and say, and address him and say, Tim, we are delighted that you're here with us. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, if you're a church person, you just assume you're welcome to church. Yeah. But if you're carrying a lot of baggage or you just haven't been there in a long time and you're feeling guilty about that, just the welcoming. Again, this goes back to all those ministers helping, volunteer ministers helping is so big and so huge. Yeah. And going back to what you're saying earlier about learning how to think strategically, and that's part of what you expressed in the whole Timonium Tim thing, wasn't it? Just because you say, who's the demographic around our church? Who's out there that's not coming to church? And who are the people? And so you just began to think in a way uh, very strategically. And then what did you as a staff get together and say, okay, this is our, you know, through Tim up there, <clears throat> Timonium Tim and said, how, we get him, how do we get him in the building? Is that essentially what you did or? That's essentially, I think we had to evangelize or, or kind of communicate to our own community. That's what we we're trying to do is we made changes Many people in our community were like, what are they doing? <laughs> yeah. Why are they doing this? It just seemed weird and strange because we, yeah. we, we were changing some things. And, you know, when you change people, people don't like change. It's just the yeah. nature. Right. But you need to give them the why. And we said here, we kind of, you know, try to paint a picture to your community first through these, you know, in, in certain meetings and then Father White and his homily, you know, just saying, here's Tim. And he explained a lot of things, some of the things I mentioned to you. And yeah. that's why we're changing. That's why we're doing things a little differently because we want Tim to come to church. We want. Well, change is hard for people, especially when it comes to church and the grooves that people are in and stuff like that. Did you get pushback? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, how did you handle pushback? Sometimes not well. <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes not well. We've kind of learned different ways. We could have been a little bit better at it. Yeah. Um, I think our general thing was to just keep moving forward and that you paint a vision and you say, this is where we're going. Mm -hmm. And some of you don't want to come with us. We understand. Um, but it's where we're going and you yeah. just keep moving forward. Yeah, that's good stuff. Well, friends, as uh, Tom was saying that a key part of the renewal of their own church and the rebuilding and getting their minds clear and their hearts clear was the power of the word of God. One of the things I've done this past year is write a little booklet called the new evangelization, what's our message? At the heart of our, our work in the church is to proclaim the gospel. But if we don't know the gospel, we can't effectively proclaim it. And wrote this book to help you to be able to do that. We'll be back in just a minute. At the heart of the new evangelization is the proclamation of the gospel, which St. Paul describes as the power of God for salvation. Brothers and sisters, it's the good news about the person of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Recent popes have reminded us that all believers, by virtue of their baptism, have been personally commissioned and sent by Jesus to tell others about him. In my new booklet, The New Evangelization, What's Our Message? I outline the essential elements of the gospel in a clear and concise way that makes the message accessible to you and can help you convey it to others. To receive your free copy of What's Our Message? Visit our website at renewalministries.net or call 1-800-282-4789. 
Join us in sharing this good news. God bless you. Welcome back, friends. I'm Peter Herbeck. I'm here with Tom Corcoran, the co-author of Rebuilt, the story of a Catholic parish, awakening the faithful, reaching the lost, and making church matter. How can, how can people get a hold of the book? Uh, you can buy it through Amazon or Barnes and Noble okay. uh, and uh, through our publisher, Ave Maria Press. Okay, and, and if people wanted to know more about the min your ministry at Nativity and the work that you're doing with Rebuild, how can they get a hold or learn more about what you're doing? It's a couple of websites. Uh, there's rebuiltparish.com, so that's directly related to the book. And then welcome to check out our website, churchnativity.tv. Very good, uh, Christina, our, our very competent producer. We'll make sure that all that is up on the screen. Great. And I just want to ask a couple questions. Folks might be listening, say, well, wait a minute. You know, they've gotten a lot of help from Saddleback Church, and aren't they just kind of moving their parish to be more Protestant? And are they losing their Catholic identity? And how do you answer those kinds of questions? You know, I think, number one, I've never had concern about that because I feel really well grounded in my Catholic faith. Yeah. And, um, so I, I think, one, I, I'm always a little bit surprised by that question, but we've had that question before. Yeah, yeah. I think, two, that we say our Pro that our Protestant brothers and sisters are our separated brethren. Mm -hmm. That's what Vatican II said. And if they're our separated brethren, then that means God is working through them. And if God's working through them, we can learn from them. And um, yeah, we have, our, we have our real differences, that, right. that they're real. They're real, yeah. And they're important, but we're still brothers and sisters. Brothers in and Christ, sisters. we're baptized into Christ. Right. Yeah. And I think if we are separated, there's probably things they can learn from us and things we can learn from them. And so it behooves us to learn from each other. Um, and I think just for us, too, the Eucharist is, is still the center of our faith. And um, we are trying to draw people back to the Eucharist. We say it's about coming to the weekend mass, and that's where the you know to the Eucharist. And so, I, I think um, we kind of take that as a given. So I, I think some of the things in the book are not. We've heard said, well, you don't talk enough about the Eucharist. Well, we think we're doing the Eucharist fine. Um, yeah. Obviously, we, in some ways, we can't mess that up because Jesus promises right. to do that for us. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of other things we can learn and do better. And so that's just the focus of the book and what we're trying to accomplish. No, very good. I feel like I could spend another couple hours just talking to you about what's in the book and the things that you guys are experiencing. And uh, I just want to I want to thank you for you guys uh, stepping out. And you're part of it's very encouraging. You're part of, a, I think, a broader work of the Holy Spirit in the church today. And friends, God is moving in this challenging time in the life of the church. There's no doubt about it. But the Lord has plans and the Lord is working plans and rebuilt. But there's a whole lot of other things you've seen on this program and that we can point to that show you the, the new springtime has begun to burst and God wants you to be a part of that new springtime, every single baptized person. So Tom, thanks for being here and friends, we look forward to seeing you again next week on another edition of The Choices We Face.